On today's episode of Women of Impact, Justin Baldoni shot to superstardom playing the extremely masculine playboy Raphael in Jane the Virgin. And today he opens up about his personal struggles. I didn't program myself. None of us did. Our fathers didn't program themselves. Where does this come from? And breaks the booze by talking about the pressures and shame that is put upon men since childhood. As a man, I can exert power over other men, but it's much easier to exert power over women because I'm physically stronger. With his viral TED talk and now book, Man Enough, we talk about everything from male dominance to sensitivity and everything in between. And there isn't room for men or boys to really have that space to be open and vulnerable and honest with each other. If you want to understand the men in your life and build a stronger, closer, more intimate and meaningful relationship with them, then get ready because we're about to go deep. Let, let's go with this conversation. I Women of Impact starts right now. Oh, Lisa, I'm so happy to be here. You're like the ultimate hype person. I feel like I want to bring you around with me to start all of my interviews and podcasts. That's a, that's, I'm very flattered. Thank you. Of course. Well, Justin, I want to start this interview with addressing a major F up that I made. Now, this is actually our second interview. We <laughs> went to a I was hoping, I was like, we can't talk about all of this without talking about the fact that We've done this already. A hundred percent. And here's why I want to bring it up. It was such a powerful example of your book. Now, let me explain. So we recorded this about three weeks ago. We were like 40 minutes in, 50 minutes in. And I realized <laughs> I had a tech error and I wasn't actually recording. Now, in that moment, my heart just broke. It crushed. The interview was so good. I was having so much fun. And in me having to say that out loud and tell you, I just, all the negative voices, the insecurity in myself, the, mm. you know, the Lisa who was, you know, 14 and would be picked on all came rushing back, all the insecurities. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do a different thing that what the young Lisa would do. I'm going to reach out to him and just tell him how much I appreciate your grace. And when I did that, your reply was so incredible that I started to tell my husband, I was like, he's so lovely. He's so humble. He's so gentle. He's so kind. And he's so nice. Now, mm -hmm. the second I said that it reminded me of a part of your book, which you said as a kid, you were told not to be too nice and not to like all the don'ts, don't be too nice. Don't be this. Don't be that because yeah. people don't want to perceive you as a quote unquote pussy or quote unquote gay if you're too nice. And it all hit me on how you have come full circle in it was because you were so sweet, so gentle, so gracious that made me see you as an incredible human and an incredible man. So I want to talk about how you were told all these things as a kid. You've worked on yourself to unwire it. And now in my mind is exactly where you've come full circle, where you are totally man enough by doing almost the opposite of what you were taught. Well, uh, well first of all, thank you. Um, the, so I have two, I have two feelings in response to what you just said. One is like, I feel I'm super grateful. I flattered, my ego is glowing, that you're saying all these kind things to me. The other thing is I feel bummed out that this wouldn't have been the normal response to an error. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that you are going above and beyond to praise me and saying how nice I was because there was a recording error that wasn't your fault, and even if it had been, it's just kind of sad because it just shows you how low the bar is <laughs> that like, here you are talking to this guy who released his book. And like, I could have been a total dick. Maybe. I don't know. Like, I don't know what maybe was in your mind. Cause you also have a lot of your preconceived notions of what maybe celebrity is or folks in this realm are. And, and I think at the end of the day, I just wish that I wish the bar wasn't that low and that it was just normal. Right. Um, I just, I just know that I, I try to put myself into the other person's shoes as much as I possibly can in a given day. Mm -hmm. And had I been you, 
and we'd done this whole 50 minutes of time, I would have been mortified too. And so it immediately just made me like my heart broke for you. And the last thing I was thinking about was me or my time. I was just like, of course, we'll just do it again. It's all good. We'll have a different conversation. Um, but I know what it's like. I've been in situations like that. And, and I think that's what's missing is we're not, we're not taught, especially as men, to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of another person, to put ourselves in, um, in that position and imagine what it would be like as if. So I don't know. I, I, I don't think that, I don't think what we did was anything special. I think you would have done the same thing for me. And it's and just, that's human. That's, that's us being humans together, right? It's us humans being. It is a hundred percent, but I don't want to like dismiss what you were taught and told as a kid, right? Like that's yeah. such a big part of it because the thing that I do with my show, Women of Impact is to acknowledge the way we are, acknowledge the things we've been taught and then go, does it serve us? Yes or no. And then how do we move towards what's serving us? So I looked- So I was absolutely acknowledged. I was absolutely taught that. You're right. I was absolutely taught to not be that. But all of us boys were. Right. Right. What actually, I actually, I'm sorry. This is your podcast. I don't- No, please jump in. but But I'm wondering, and this is, maybe we're just going totally off topic here. But my thought, my question for you is, as you were praising me in front of your husband, did that make him feel insecure at all? No. Because I always am so interested in what happens when women praise other men in front of other men. Because we're taught, as men, we're taught to see that as a threat. Um, and that's, what, that's the first thing that came to my mind is when you were talking about how nice and kind and humble I was your husband um what that conversation was like because i know there are many men where there's no room for that conversation that's like they'll immediately just try to one-up the person and put that person down and i love that i love i mean i know a little bit about your husband and he seems like a wonderful man um but yeah so that was that was the first thing that came to my mind let's let let's go with this conversation i actually really like it because that's what's authentic and that's really why i was been so excited and i was so heartbroken about our last interview because the truth is justin your book the things that you say the things that you're you talk about are so real to you and i think a lot of things can be universal to other guys out there but talk to me about how you had to come to the point where you i initially weren't given the room to be able to be open because that's what's quote unquote, what a man should do. They shouldn't be open, yeah. and vulnerable. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't really given the room. Mm. There's no room given uh, that's not, I don't, I don't think our society works that way because we very much live in a patriarchal culture and society that thrives off of the, the power dominance model. And there isn't room for men or boys to really have that space to be open and vulnerable and honest with each other. I would never ask women to have compassion for men. Uh, I would ask women to see how the patriarchal structure and system hurts men and let that be the entry point into compassion. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah. So yeah, I don't think there was much room for me. I think what ended up happening was it was kind of a, it was a choice that had to be made. It was, do I want to keep suffering and keep hurting the people that I love unbeknownst to me? I mean, just like hurting people. I was totally ignorant. Um, and, and I just feel like I'm, I was just tired of hurting myself, hurting the people I loved. And I just was ready to like, just throw, I wanted to like tear it all down. Which, why is this? Why does this exist? Who built this system? Why was I programmed? I didn't, I didn't program myself. None of us did. Our fathers didn't program themselves. Where does this come from? And there's so many stories that are passed down to us from generation to generation that are not ours. Traumas that are passed down to us from generation to generation that are not ours, but become ours. And we have to start to question and become curious as to where these things come from. Because if we don't call them out, if we don't know that they're there, we can't ever say, wait, this isn't mine. Mm. I don't need to carry this anymore. I can't remove that if I'm not even aware that I'm carrying it. And so then once I'm aware that I'm carrying it, I can make a conscious choice to say, well, I, I don't want to carry this anymore. This was, this was never mine to carry. Mm. This was never mine as a young boy. I, when I was born, I was free. Baha'u'llah in the Baha'i faith says, I've created the rich 
Why dost thou bring thyself down to abasement? Noble, I created thee. I was built and created free without any of these shackles of traditional masculinity. I danced, I cried, I sang, I was open. I wasn't worried about it. All of this stuff was put on me. It wasn't mine. And that's where we have to start to unlearn and kind of start to question everything. And that's what I did is I decided that I would rather challenge a system that will make me feel less than, that will make me feel like a traitor to my own gender, than continue to be miserable. And I'm not, it's not, I'm not saying that I'm not miserable sometimes because I'm still on learning and I'm very much on the journey. This book is a part of my journey. I'm, I am walking on the journey with the audience, with the reader. I'm a work in progress. I haven't arrived, as I say oftentimes in the book. But I would rather go on that journey and, try and be a traitor um, than knowingly and unknowingly suffer and hurt the people that I loved, including myself. Oh, that was really strong. Um, and I know that that for you has been an evolution. It has been a step-by-step. It's not overnight. And what I love about your book is you really do break them down into sections of this is what I was told and this is how I overcome. And there's a couple that I just pulled that I find extremely fascinating that I would love to very- Ooh, Tell me more, yeah. I'd very specifically tell love to more. dive deep in, into. So one thing you say, so you actually mentioned it, so let's just go off that. So the confident enough. So I know you said you were like hurting a lot of people and you just said enough was enough but you also say there is some form of I don't want to this probably isn't your language so correct me when I say the word power that's the word I like but there is when you exude power there does come an element of confidence that makes you feel good about yourself but also in that moment is when you're demeaning other people you may be hurting other people you may be pushing them down so talk to me about that because how how did you start to pass that out and then step out of it especially with your wife who was looking at you saying to you hey you've you've crossed that line you've overstepped yeah. you're, you're shutting me down well, I, one of the things I don't really have regrets, but one of the things I wish I could have expounded on in the book is, is really calling it what it is, which is naming the patriarchy, because that's what that what that power is, is socialized behavior taught in a patriarchal system. I think that a lot of this is learned, and I think that it feels good to exert power and dominance over somebody else because of that's how we have uh, built this entire system for ourselves. That's how we have, that's how we've created this world is that when I am stronger than you, I feel better. Right. But therefore when I am weaker than you, I feel worse. Does that really work for anybody? I mean, these are, these are temporary feelings that don't ever lead us to true lasting happiness or change? Is it really joyful? Or is there really a part of us, if we tap into the empathetic, compassionate parts of ourselves, the parts of ourselves that as men, we're not allowed to feel, would there be a part of us that actually feels bad and feels that pain of the other person when we exert dominance and power over them? And if there is that part of ourselves, have we completely numbed ourselves and cut ourselves off from that feeling of empathy and drowned it out to make room for the feeling of power mm. and confidence. And again, I'm not, I, I, I look, I, I haven't written a treatise on this. I'm not a researcher. I could, you know, I'm sure there's going to be people listening that are going to challenge that belief. Oh, it's natural. It's human nature to do this. But I just, I just believe we're better than that. I just believe as human beings, we're better than that. We weren't given the ability to feel for another human mm. for no reason. We weren't given the ability to to cry and to to just want to hold somebody else who's in pain for no reason we're all cells in a human body and i believe we're designed so that when one cell is hurting the other cells are hurting but i think we numb ourselves because then there's just too much hurting there's too much pain so really i'm asking questions i'm just saying is this i don't know Mm -hmm. the answer but i um i've had to unlearn um a lot of what you're talking about, because yes, I do feel powerful as a man, as a human, when I exert power over somebody else. The problem with that is uh, it's a zero sum game because as a man, I can exert power over other men, but it's much easier to exert power over women because I'm physically stronger. 
-hmm. right? And, uh, and that doesn't make any sense because what ends up happening is you start to exert power over the person, if you're in a hetero relationship like me, that you love the most. This person that wants to hold you and be there for you. The person who <laughs> is who you've let in right? Who you, who you've let into to your innermost guarded secrets. And yet there's something wrong. If I feel confidence or pleasure exerting power over this person who loves me for me. And this is the problem with our system is that men are desperately seeking power because we are told from a very young age that that's where confidence comes from. That's where, that's what it means to be a man bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, right? In all areas of our lives. But where, where do we go when we can't exert that power? Where do we go when there isn't somebody to be bigger, stronger, or faster than? Where do we go when we're at the bottom of that chain? Well, we go to women. We're going to queer folks. We're going to or trans folks, right? And you look at it and you can see the data and we end up hurting our partners. We end up destroying our relationships because we haven't been taught. We don't know where to seek power. When in reality... We don't have to seek power. It's not a thing to go and find. It's a thing that's innate within us. And it starts with recognizing our own enoughness. So, wow, that was amazing. And as you were talking, I think that that was, it hits me to your question that you asked me earlier about my husband on why he didn't get any jealous or weird when I was like gloating about how lovely you were. And it's because he's built confidence in other things. Like he doesn't feel like he needs to exude power over me, over you, over anyone. And so if I come to him saying how amazing this like lovely man is, he has confidence within himself. And so, but he's had to build that. And that's, I yeah. think where, at least for me, I encouraged that when we first got together and vice versa. It's the same with like jealousy on the other side. It's if I yeah. see him talking to a woman or if he came to me gloating about how wonderful a woman is, I need to feel secure in myself to be able to hear it and not feel threatened. And that's actually the thing, almost like when you talk about power, it's like the power comes so that you don't feel the threat actually, which is huh, quite interesting. Um, and maybe that's kind of what you're talking about on that you, if you find that confidence within yourself and you see what you love, like your partner, you then feel like, feel the threat. You can kind of just lean into it. Yeah. If you feel enough as you are, if you feel mm -hmm. like your partner loves you for you, then you don't, that there is no threat. There is no fear because you you have a healthy, strong relationship or you have a healthy relationship with yourself and therefore somebody else's happiness, success, beauty mm. doesn't diminish yours, mm -hmm. right? That's why, that's why, you know, it's this idea of privilege is so tri tricky for so many people is it's not earned. Mm. Privilege isn't earned, it's given at birth or it's given. And so that's why for so many people with privilege, equality can feel like oppression. Because when somebody else who wasn't given the same privilege is being propped up like an equity, like when we talk about an equitable world, it can feel like the person with privilege is having something taken from them. Mm. When in reality, enoughness would mean that we want that person who wasn't given that birthright of privilege to have enough to have a chance to thrive in the way that I have. Mm. And it's the same thing with relationships, the same thing for anything. We should, as human beings, I believe, be cheering each other on. We should be wanting other people to be successful. We should be wanting that person to win or that friend to hit it big or to get that part or to get a good guest on their podcast or whatever it is. We want that because their success doesn't diminish mine because I know my worth in my enoughness. And I battled this a, a lot, especially, you know, growing up as an actor and my, you know, falling and acting at 20, having a bunch of friends, you know, you're all young and in acting classes and, and you boom, this guy hits it big. And suddenly you, the first thought is like, Oh, I suck. <laughs> is there something wrong with me? What about me? But that comes from a feeling of insecurity of not feeling enough of the world telling me that I'm not enough versus now one of my friends gets a part and I'm cheering him on. I'm, I'm crying with him. I want him to have success. And one could argue, well, that's because I've experienced success. 
But I would say that some of the most incredible friends that I have, the most noble, beautiful people I know, have showed me firsthand who don't have the level of, of material success that I have, but have a deep spiritual success, have success in their families and their personal lives. They have been cheering me on and rooting for me, and they don't have anything close to this. Mm. And they have taught me what that looks like. So again, it comes down to our own, like, how do we value ourselves? How do we look at ourselves? When we look in the mirror, what do we see? How do we, what's our self-talk? Are we, are we relying on the world, the material superficial world to dictate our happiness? Is everything external or is it internal? A hundred percent. And everything you're saying really does tie into, again, like I'm going to go back to, I just want to understand, right? What's the opposite sex and you know, because I'm in a heterosexual marriage, so I just want to you yeah. know, make that clear. But like what my husband is feeling, um, what m- brothers and friends, because once you understand, I do think there's just an element of empathy that can come with then going to them and pushing them and say, hey, this actually doesn't work for me. I'm here for you. How do we get through this together? But this doesn't work. And instead of, you know, putting the stake in the ground and go, no, this is who I am. What I love about everything you're saying is you're just looking at your past. And it's exactly what I do as a woman. Like, Justin, seriously, I look at the past and I go, oh, that's what I've been taught. That's why I act like that. That doesn't serve me. So now I need to change. And I articulate that to my husband. And so- Please. But oftentimes, but look at that behavior. Unfortunately, and fortunately, you've been taught and socialized as a woman that that's okay. Because see, you function in community. You're taught early on um, that that um, feedback is is okay. That that you can that that you you're taught to be vulnerable. You're in fact you're taught that vulnerability is how you build connection and relationships. Whereas men are taught the opposite. So, so by nature, you're, you're displaying what I wish more of us men would be able to do, which is, oh, wait, that didn't work for me. Let me learn why. But you've been taught as a woman generally, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing yeah, here, please. that it's okay to ask yourself questions. <laughs> yeah. It's okay to ask yourself how you're feeling. Hmm. It's okay to ask yourself if this is working or is this serving me? Or in general, that's an okay thing for a woman to do because you're taught that it's okay for you to be emotional or to make choices. Ooh, I don't know about that, Justin. It's usually, so here's the thing, you've been taught the, to, but you get taught, judged. Judged. It, it by, well, there's two parts to that, right? Yeah. So, so that's, that is the fun. Uh, and I joke when I say fun part of the patriarchy, Yeah. <laughs> which is it wants to put you in a box and it has a double standard. So as a woman, I believe you're taught that it's okay to be emotional because you're not told not to cry growing up. You're taught, okay, girls cry. You're taught emotion. However, the second you enter what the patriarchy deems a man's place, you can't be emotional. You're not allowed. You're, you, you're not, you have to conform. And if you, and you're immediately judged for the very same things that are okay for men. You're not allowed to be, you're not allowed to be strong and have a sense of direction or or to be firm in your decisions. You're not allowed to, to, to maybe um, critique somebody or talk down to somebody in the way that men do. If you're, if you're going to play in the patriarchy and a woman uh, um, jumps into the workforce and is a leader, the very same things she does that a man does, she's called a bitch for. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. So, so it's both, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, mm-hmm. in my opinion which is what I meant by at a young age, we're taught it's okay to be emotional. But yes, of course, you're not allowed to be emotional. God forbid you're an emotional, then you're an emotional woman. Right, then you're too sensitive. Then you're this. No one takes you serious. And you're not fit to be a leader and it's all this stuff. But that's the bullshit double standard of what we're living. And this is what happens when we're socialized this way. There's no space. There's no space for, it's like, it. and my wife and I have had conversations about this and this is what breaks my heart, seeing the daughter, seeing my daughter. And looking at my wife, who's, who's starting this amazing business right now, um, is <laughs> there's there's it's almost like the way we've built this thing. A woman needs to be a certain type of person in order to be a leader, and sometimes that that goes against her nature. Mm-hmm. My wife struggles so much. She's like, "Why can't I be soft and be a leader?" Why can't, why, like, why can't I just be me? What if I am feminine? Why do I have to change to be a man to lead? 
Like, why is that the only reason, only way men will listen to me is when I'm strong and when I'm firm, suddenly you'll listen to me. But if I don't, you walk all over me. And we've talked about, we've had these conversations and it breaks my heart that this is the culture that we're in, that she's not allowed to just show up and be her, to be sweet and to be sensitive and compassionate in order to lead an organization or to get ahead. And it's also very rare for men to even be able to do that as leaders. Why? Because that's seen as weak, which is the massive issue that we have and what we're teaching our young boys and girls. That as a boy, we, we're not allowed to be sensitive and sweet or emotional. We're not allowed to care about somebody else's feelings. I would argue that that's what would make you the greatest leader, mm-hmm. the best leader, the best leaders in the world care deeply about the people that work for them. They care deeply about their feelings and emotions. They hurt when they're hurting. That's how you change policies in the workplace. That's how you root out the bad eggs. That's how you keep people safe because you care. You don't wait until somebody is hurt and the thing blows up and you you do it because the PR tells you to do it. No, you, you actually care. And that's built off of empathy and compassion. Which, un- which fortunately and unfortunately, women are strong in and men are not because we're not allowed to be because we're taught we can't. Very strong. You just gave me the chills there. Um, it's so interesting what we're talking about because what I love is these types of discussions that are going to pr- um, poke change, right? It's poking change in how we think now so that we can tomorrow, next week, in a month, in a year, get better. And then also the younger generation is what are the language that we're going to be telling, like you said, our sons and daughters of the world. Um, And how do we start opening up the space so that we allow these, um, you know, stereotypes to no longer exist? Um, And so, for instance, um, I had an interview with a, with a psychotherapist last week, Justin, and one of her biggest com- things is the woman's usually complaining that the guy doesn't open up. He doesn't share. He's not <laughs> emotional. She's like almost to a T. That's that's what happens. And then what happens almost to a T is she she's in therapy. So she gets the guy to open up and she's like almost to a T you look at the woman and she's a deer in headlights because now the guy has no idea what to do. She's has no freaking idea. He's in tears. They've said, I want him to open up. And now what's happened is they've opened up and they open up completely, but we kind of, it, she calls it the Goldilocks effect where it's like, we want them to open up, but not too much. And so I love all of this with the no judgment of, The reality is we're still at that point where we want men to open up. We want them to be fully themselves. And yet it's still difficult for a lot of women. I I admire, I want to honor you saying that because I think that's a hard thing to say as a woman. Um, Because a lot of women, a lot of women say that they want it until they get it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's really brave of you and important that you said that because I can't even tell you the amount of messages I've gotten from men who are like, Hey dude, I did what you said. It didn't go well. And I think it's very, very important. First of all, if you're listening to this, to not like get defensive, (laughs) like the first place we go is defensiveness. And we have to recognize, and I said, I think, I think I said this earlier, is that all of us have been raised in the same system. That means that you and I were both raised being told that boys don't cry. Mm-hmm. You heard it and I heard it. Mm-hmm. So if the young girls heard it and the young boys heard it, well, that stays with you as you grow up. If, uh, if you're, if you're a, a little girl and you hear a boy say to another boy, you kick like a girl or, oh, uh-huh, don't be a girl. Oh, look at him crying. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's weaponized against that boy. There's a part of you that doesn't even realize that it hurts you. You haven't even been able to, you're, you're, you haven't carved those neural pathways in your brain to recognize that that probably hurts you because you're being told that you're less than. Your existence as a girl, your sheer existence is an insult to a boy, which means you are 
devaluing yourself without even realizing it. This is, this is why words matter. Mm -hmm. Right. And so here you are, you're growing up, no girls allowed, all of this stuff, boys, how are, how are we, how do we treat girls that we like when we're young? We're mean to them. Right. And we're told it's okay. (laughs) And the girls are told, Oh, he just likes you. Exactly. So what are we teaching our girls that to get, to receive like or love, you should accept abuse. You should accept abuse. Exactly. And, and I wish I could have written a longer book and gone into all of this because it's not in the book. I just touch on it. This is like a, this is like a, the opening masterclass. <laughs> this is to open yourself up. The book is like to open you up to these conversations, mm-hmm. but if we really dissect it, we go deep, then you, then you, then you're brought up and, and let's be honest, the majority of young girls are brought up in a family that's very much patriarchal in the way that it's in the way that it's uh, governed. You have the father who's the head of the household. I'm just generalizing. Yeah, sure. All right. I'm not saying hundred percent, 90%. Let's just say more than 50%. Um, our, our of young girls are brought up in this type of society where the man sits at the head of the table, you know, and many men are emotionally unavailable and we want and expect our men to be strong. Because it's also reinforced in social media. It's also reinforced in entertainment and news. It's reinforced everywhere. Where would you want you go to the movies? Who gets the girl? Gets possessive. Who gets the girl? The the strong, brave, emotional, like unemotional guy. The the badass, the leader, the the guy who killed a thousand people, the the warrior. He gets the girl. Well, you don't see him weak. You don't see him being vulnerable, breaking down in tears and crying to the girl. No, we don't see these images. Mm. And oftentimes we've never seen our fathers demonstrate that. Oh, yeah. So young girls grow up, they don't see their dads crying and and telling their their moms, you know, I'm worried about this. No, the fathers grow up and they feel they need to protect their families. They feel like they can't show weakness. They don't want to show their kids weakness. They can't show vulnerability or, or that they don't know where they're going or and even when things are terrible, they don't, they don't show it. So young girls grow up never seeing it, mm. but they crave it, but then they get it and they have no idea what to do with it. And I, and I hope that women that are listening to this can take this in is it's not your fault. Mm. It's not your fault. If you want your man to open up and then he opens up and you don't know what to do, it doesn't make you a bad woman. It just means that you were socialized in the same way that he was. Mm. And together we have to unlearn. That is why the feminist movement says that our liberations are tied together. Your liberation is tied to mine. The feminist movement can only flourish if men are liberated. We have to be willing to cry and be emotional and vulnerable to the women in our lives and the women in our lives have to brush up against that discomfort because we are being, you are being forced to look at a man who is breaking the patriarchal standards of what it means to be a man. And if we don't do that together, we'll never fly. That's why in the Baha'i faith, when Abdul Baha says that humanity can be likened to a bird on one wing is female and the other wing is male, but it's not until the wings are equivalent in strength that the bird can fly. That's what that means. Mm. We're tied together. And right now the wings are clipped and all of us have unlearning to do. The men have to break, break free and be willing to be vulnerable, not just with women, but with other men. And women have to unlearn all of the things that they've been taught. And together we have to look at this and say, Hey, what works? What doesn't? Why, why am I, why do I feel that way when you open up? This isn't about you. Hold on. And guess what? My wife and I have been through this. We're, we, we, we go to couples therapy. We just talked about this not too long ago. And what we can't do is give this fuel for the group of men that exist in the world that say, well, this is proof that women need strong men, or this is proof that you got to be strong. Because all, all we're doing is just reinforcing the patriarchal ideas that this doesn't work, hmm. right? As long as we're willing to unlearn, we can make progress. Wow. So I live in a world in my own head where I have a duality in the sense of I want my husband to be super vulnerable, super honest, super transparent of how he's feeling, the good, the bad, the ugly, the crying, the tears, the snots, like everything. And yet I also, if I have fear, I want him to step up and step in and protect me. 
And yeah. part of me, right, because with what people are saying, like a lot of people are saying, you shouldn't need anyone to protect you. And, and here's the thing, it's, I think it becomes dangerous when you're using something as a crutch or you're using, or something in your life becomes detrimental to your self-esteem. But for me, I love being able to turn to my husband. If, you know, our house alarm goes off, um, I am looking to him and saying, well, you're going to get the burglar, right? Like I don't plan to jump out yeah. of bed and be in front of him blocking the, the bullet. And so having that honest discussion without it demeaning my own mental strength, like that doesn't make yeah. me feel less than, that doesn't make me feel weak. And for him, it makes him feel good about himself. And so I think we found this beautiful dynamic where you said about sitting at the head of the table. It's amazing because we have this really long dining table. And every time we go to sit, my husband's like, babe. And he literally goes to give me the head of the seat. Now, I was brought up in a very traditional Greek family. And I loved seeing my dad at the head of the table. And so even now, I say to him, nope, I want to see you there. And I love it. Now, that's the thing. I used to battle it. Being like, oh, my God, would the people see me as less of a woman? Because I like seeing my husband there because things, you know. And so then I started to battle my own feelings. And I was like, hang on a minute. I'm losing sight of what's actually going on. If it's not detrimental to your self-esteem, if this is something that you're looking for, if this makes you feel better about yourself, yeah. if you if you can lean into it and you're not giving your power away to someone and you're coming together like those wings and you're moving together and on that same page, I think it could yeah. be beautiful. And I eventually had to own that as well. I think that's really, really interesting, Lisa. And yeah, I agree with you completely. The only thing I would ask you is, because this is what we have to be careful of, is do you like seeing him there because your father was there? hundred percent. And, and would it have been okay if your mother was there? And if you were raised in a, if you were raised where your mother was at the head of the table, then would that mean that you wanted to be at the head of the table? And I think all that matters is that we question these things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but it reminds me of the story. So as, as human beings, we're so funny. We had, we're, we're these very odd creatures because we take traditions, we don't know where the traditions come from, and then we adapt them as law. And we, we don't even understand or know why we do, but it's just the way that it is. And then we're told not to question it, right? And <laughs> so I was, I was a dear friend of mine named Oscar. Uh, he's also a Baha'i and we were having these spiritual deepenings. And there's a part of the Baha'i faith that tells us that we should abandon traditions whenever possible, or at the very least to question them. We should question where these things mm -hmm. come from. And he started telling me about his Thanksgiving that he grew up with. And um, his grandmother was the matriarch. Um, everybody went to her place and cooked and ate Thanksgiving. And they always did ham. They didn't do turkey. So he starts telling me the story of how every year at Thanksgiving, um, they would always eat ham, but it was always cut in half. And it, one ham was cooked and then the second ham was cooked. And it was just this special, and it was like the best ham in the world. And everybody looked forward to it. It's grandma's ham. And then grandma passed away. And then, uh, and then mom started doing it and blah, blah, blah. And at one point, and they've been doing this for 50, 60 years, right? At one point, somebody said in the family, um, why do we do this? I'm just curious. Why, why do we cut the ham in half? And and is, is it, was it, does it, is it juicier? Is it, does it cook better? What is it? And the mom laughed. I said, oh, well, <laughs> grandma stove was too small. <laughs> and it was the only way they could cook the ham was there would only fit half. Right. And so then they'd cook one and they cook the other half and then they would serve it to everybody. And now the stove's plenty big, but they still do it the exact same way. They never cook the ham. They never, they cut in half and they, 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 they just do one and then the other, but nobody questioned it. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, why are we still doing it? And then the mom says, that's a really good question. I don't know <laughs> because grandma did it and we miss her and we love her and it makes right. But it doesn't matter. The point is, is that these things sometimes start be because they have to, mm -hmm. we don't understand the origins of all of our traditions per se, or, or why a man needs to sit at the head of the table. We know how we feel growing up because we love our fathers in your case. And then we, and oftentimes find somebody who makes us feel a certain way. 
reminds us of our parents, whether we want to talk about that or not, good or bad. And you want that. So there's something familiar about it, mm-hmm. but we should always question. Yes. And that's my point is we must remain curious and question because if you were raised in a very different way and then your mom was the matriarch and wanted to sit at the head of the table and maybe was the breadwinner and your father would stay at home, you might take your rightful place at the head of the table. And it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that we have to flip it all. What I'm saying is so long as we understand where these feelings come from, then we can progress, right? You can, you can, we can question things because if you ever decide to have kids, then you're going to have to ask yourself, okay, well, what do I want my daughter or my son to see? And that's how things change. That's how we move. That's how we move things forward. We question and then we make, uh, and then we respond. I mean, that's so on point with exactly what your book does is, well, hang on a minute. I was told this, let me question it. How did this actually then affect my life? And how did I show up because of that? And I love actually that you pushed me on it. And as you were saying, my grandmother was absolutely the matriarch of my family. And then it was my father. And, but I remember seeing my grandmother doing the most ridiculous, ridiculous things it was very traditional back then but women if you were the matriarch you didn't eat when everyone else ate so it was like you were the matriarch but you actually ate last it's like the freaking weirdest thing yeah because you're she was the matriarch in a patriarchal system right now so here's the thing here justin is i saw that and even as a young girl i was like that is so ridiculous i can't believe that a woman would think that she would have to eat after a man so there's that part of me that is <laughs> extremely like bullish in that is a ridiculous i'm never going to do that that puts women down and so i'm going to shut that down yeah. and then the other side of myself that looks at my husband who sits at the head of the table and go i actually really like this and i don't and that's want- okay exactly and and that's the point is that it's okay yes, yes. all i want and this is this is how i can sum up what my hope is mm. my hope for men is that they don't feel they have to sit at the head of the table to feel like a man. I don't care where you sit. I don't care where you sit. I don't want to ever have my masculinity um, be contingent on where I sit at whatever table. I should be able to sit at the floor. I should be able to sit at the side of the table or the head of the table and nothing should change how I feel about myself, right? This is the issue with masculinity. So, so long as we're questioning these things and the way that I do it is this, if I sit at the head of the table and I feel powerful and good and I start to feel like that's my rightful spot, that's a problem. (laughs) And I need to have the wherewithal to be able to, to watch that. And if suddenly I find myself going, oh no, this is my spot, get out of my spot. Then, I'm, then that's a problem. And so what I do is I watch it. And I'm like, you know what? My ego's flaring up right now. I'm not going to sit here. I'm going to let, I'm going to invite someone else to sit here. And I want to, I want to be in that discomfort of feeling less than for a second, because that's where the growth is. Because it's all in my mind. It's not real. It's an idea. This masculinity, masculinity is an idea. It's a performance. It's performative. Right. If I suddenly feel less than as an example, right. I drive a nice car, but I didn't always, there was a time in my life as I write about in the book where I had a nice car, but I couldn't afford it. And I did it not because I earned it, but because I wanted people to perceive me a certain way. All right. So now I drive a nice car. If I drive a different car or if I have a rental car that isn't as nice, is my ego affected? Do I feel less than if it is, then who I am as Justin, who I want to be is shit. I'm going to, I need to get rid of my car and drive a lesser one because I want to, I want to humble myself. I don't want my ego to be puffed up and congratulated because of external forces. I want to drive a nice car because I earned it and I feel good in it. But if I really have earned it, if I really feel good in it, it doesn't matter what kind of car I'm going to drive the next day. Because I don't care what anybody else is thinking about me because I have enoughness in myself. I feel enough as I am in whatever car I'm driving. Yeah, I earned it. Some of my favorite people are billionaires who drive Priuses (laughs) or like $16,000 cars. 
And then you go to LA and you see people that are on like $120,000 a year salaries driving $120,000 cars, mm -hmm. right? So we have to just question these things. And I want to, I want to, I want men, people, but really my work is with men to be able to look at that and say, you know what? My masculinity is not dependent on where I sit at the table. And if it is, I need to sit in a different seat so that I can be reminded that we're all the same because at the end of the day, all the stuff that I'm saying, let's be clear. I'm going to leave the conversation. I'm going to wonder if I was good enough and that's okay. I'm going to wonder if I said the right things, or if I could have said something else, or if I could have said something in a different way that would have reached somebody, or if I said something that's going to be polarizing. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. All of us do, no matter who you are, how successful you are, all of us have a version of imposter syndrome. And, and that's, what's important about this book is that I write this from a place of growing. I write this as a student. I don't write this as an expert having done years of research. I'm on the journey with you. And you know what? I reserve the right to change my opinion. And to have my ideas and thoughts changed and challenged um, because I'm growing. And that's where the growth is. You want to talk about going to the gym and working out. The most masculine thing that we could possibly do is putting ourselves in positions to grow. Is challenging ourselves, challenging our ego, getting comfortable in the uncomfortable. Just like we sit in cold plunges, we need to do that emotionally and in the world. And, um, and I welcome that and I love that. And, uh, and I hope that this book, like you said, not only helps men see themselves, but helps women um, see a different side to men that we oftentimes conceal for our own safety and self-preservation. Dude, that was so powerful. So where can people find the book? Where can people find you? Uh, yeah, so Man Enough is available anywhere books are sold right now. Um, Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, uh, your local independent bookstore. Um, which I'm always encouraging people to support. And I'm, uh, I'm on Instagram and all the things, the TikToks. Ooh, Justin, Justin, thank you. Guys, guys, honestly, you got to go check out his book. It's freaking amazing. It really will help you with other men in your life, with your relationship, with understanding them, with being empathetic and building a stronger and better communication so that you can have a better relationship. So guys, go buy the book. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up, guys? Thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of badassery, make sure you watch this video right here because I know you like it. But hey, also, while you're here, guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And of course, until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.